adding and subtracting, and there was reconciling to do. The printers hummed and hummed. The natives are restless, Lester said, pointing a thumb over his shoulder at the growing queue of would-be riders. We going to be ready to open soon. Perry had fallen into a classic nerd trap of having almost solved a problem and not realizing that the last 3% of the solution would take as long as the rest of it put together. Meanwhile, the ride was in a shambles as robots attempted to print and arrange objects to mirror those around the nation. Soon soon, Perry said. He stood up and looked around at the shambles. I lie. This crap won't be ready for hours yet. Sorry. Fuck it. Open up. Lester did. I know. I know, but that s the deal with the ride. It s got to get in sync. You know we've a been working on this for months now. It s just growing pains. Here. I ll give you back your money you come back tomorrow, it ll all be set to rights. The angry rider was a regular, one of the people who came by every morning to ride before work. She was gaunt and tall and geeky and talked like an engineer, with the nerd accent. What kind of printer? Lester broke in. Perry hit his snicker with a cough. Lester would get her talking about the ins and outs of her printer. Talking shop, and before you knew it she'd be mollified. Perry sold another ticket, and another. Hi again. It was the creepy guy, the suit who'd shown up in Boston. Jan had a crazy theory about why he'd left the Boston launch in such a hurry, but who knew? Hi there. Perry said. Long time no see. Back from Boston, huh, for months. The guy was grinning and sweating and didnt looked good. He had a fresh bruise on his cheek with a couple of knuckle prints clearly visible. Can't he wait to get back on the ride? It has been too long. Sammy had been through a rehab and knew how they went. You laid off a bunch of people in one fast, hard big bang. Hired some unemployment coaches for the senior unionized employees, scheduled a couple of networking events where they could mingle with other unemployed slobs and pass around homemade business cards. You needed a Judas goat, someone who'd talk up the rehab to the other employees, whom you could rely on. Death Waits had been his Judas goat for the Fantasyland goth makeover. He de tirelessly evangelized the idea to his co-workers, had found goth true fans who de blogged the hell out of every inch of the rehab, had run every errand no matter how menial. But his passion didnt carry over to dismantling the goth rehab. Sammy should have anticipated that, but he had totally failed to do so. He was just so used to thinking of Death Waits as someone who was a never-questioning slave to the park. Come on, cheer up. Look at how cool these thrill rides are going to be. Those were your idea, you know. Check out the coffin cars and the little photo op at the end that photoshops all the riders into zombies. That ass got to be right up your alley. Right. Your friends are going to love this. Death moped as only a goth could. He performed his duties slowly and unenthusiastically. When Sammy pinned him down with a direct question, he let his bangs fall over his eyes, looked down at his feet, and went silent. Come on, what the hell is going on? The fences were supposed to be up this morning. The plan had been to get the maintenance crews in before rope dropped to fence off the doomed ride so that the dismantling could begin. But when he'd shown up at eight, there was no sign of the fences. No sign of the maintenance crews and the rides were all fully staffed. Death looked at his feet. Sammy bubbled with rage. If you cool DNT trust your own people, you were lost. There were already enough people around the park looking for a way to wrong foot him. Death. I am talking to you. For Christ's sake, Don T be such a goddamned baby. You shut down the goddamned rides and send those glue sniffers home. I want a wrecking crew here by lunchtime. Death Waits looked at his feet some more. His floppy black wings of hair covered his face, but from the snuffling noises. Sammy knew there was some crying going on underneath all that hair. Suck it up, he said, or go home. Sammy turned on his heel and started for the door, and that was when Death Waits leapt on his back, dragged him to the ground and started punching him. He wasn't much of a puncher, but he did have a lot of chunky silver skull rings that really stung. He pasted a couple good ones on Sammy before Sammy came to his senses and threw the skinny kid off of him. Strangely, Sammy's anger was dissipated by the actual, physical violence. He had never thrown a punch in his life and he was willing to bet the same was true of Death Waits. There was something almost funny about an actual punch-up. Death Waits picked himself up and looked at Sammy. 
The kid's eyeliner was in smears down his cheeks and his hair was standing up on end. Sammy shook his head slowly. Don T bother cleaning out your locker. I ll have your things sent to you. And Don T stop on your way out of the park. Either. He could have called security, but that would have meant sitting there with death waits until they arrived. The kid would go and he would never come back. He was disgraced. And leave he did. Sammy had death weight s employee pass deactivated and the contents of his locker patchouli reeking black t-shirts and blunt eyeliner pencils sent by last class mail to his house. He cut off death weight's s benefits. He had the Deadwood rides shuttered and commenced their destruction, handing over any piece recognizable as coming from a ride to the company s auction department to list online. Anything to add black to his bottom line. But his cheek throbbed where death had laid into him, and he d lost his fire for the new project. Were Fatkins a decent-sized market segment? He should have commissioned research on it. But he d needed to get a plan in the can in time to mollify the executive committee. Plus he knew what his eyes told him every day, the park was full of Fatkins, and always had been. The ghost of death waits was everywhere. Sammy had to figure out for himself whom to fire, and how to do it. He didn't really know any of the goth kids that worked the rides these days. Death Waits had hired and led them. There were lots of crying fits and threats, and the kids he didn't fire acted like they were next, and if it hadn't been for the need to keep revenue flowing. Sammy would have canned all of them. Then he caught wind of what they were all doing with their severance pay, traveling south to Hollywood and riding that goddamned Frankenride in the dead Walmart, trying to turn it into goth paradise. Judging from the message boards he surfed, the whole thing had been Death Waits' s idea. God damn it. It was Boston all over again. He de pulled the plug and the machine kept on moving. The hoardings went up and the rides came down, but all his former employees and their weird eyeliner pervert pals all went somewhere else and partied on just the same. His attendance numbers were way down, and the photo bloggers posting shots of black clouds of goths at the Frankenride made it clear where they de all gone. Fine, he thought, fine. Let us go have a look. The guy with the funny eyebrow made him immediately, but didn't seem to be suspicious. Maybe they never figured out what he'd done in Boston. The goth kids were busy in the market stalls or hanging around smoking clove and patchouli hookahs and they ignored him as a square and beneath their notice. The ride had changed a great deal since his last faded visit. He d heard about the story, of course the Dark Ride Press had reported on it in an editorial that week. But now the story which, as he could perceive it, was an orderly progression of what seemed to be someone's life unfolding from childhood naivete to adolescent exuberance to adult cynicism to a nostalgic, elderly delight was augmented by familiar accoutrements. There was a robot zombie head from one of the rides he d torn down yesterday. And here was half the sign from the coffin coaster. A bat wing bush from the hedge maze. The little bastards had stolen the deconstructed ride debris and brought it here. By the time he got off the ride, he was grinning ferociously. By tomorrow there'd be copies of all that trademarked ride stuff rolling off the printers in ten cities around the United States. That was a major bit of illegal activity, and he knew where he could find some hungry attack lawyers who d love to argue about it. He jumped on the ride again and got his camera configured for low-light shooting. Eva showed up on Perry's doorstep that night after dinner. Lester and Suzanne had gone off to the beach and Perry was alone, updating his inventory of tchotchkes with a camera and an old computer, getting everything stickered with RFIDs. She had the kids in tow. Ada spotted the two old, lovely baseball mitts on the crowded coffee table and made a beeline for them, putting one over each hand and walking around smacking them together to hear the leathery sound, snooping in drawers and peering at the business end of an arc welder that Perry hastily snapped up and put on a high shelf, which winked once to let him know that it had tracked the movement and noted the location of the tool. The little boy, Pascal, rode on his mother's hip. Eva had clearly had a bit of a cry, but had gotten over it. Now she was determined, with her jaw thrust out and her chin up tilted. I don't know what to do about him. He has been driving me crazy since he retired. You know he had an affair. He told me. She laughed. He tells everyone. He is boasting, you know. Whatever. I know why he did it. Midlife crisis. But before that, it was early adulthood crisis. An adolescent crisis. That guy doesn't know what to do with himself. 
He s a good man, but he s out of his fucking mind if he s not juggling a hundred balls. Perry tried out a noncommittal shrug. You re his buddy. I know. But you have to see that it s true. Right. I love him. I really do, but he s got a self destructive streak a mile wide. It doesn't matter how much he loves me or the kids, if he s not torturing himself with work, he s got to come up with something else to screw up his life. I thought that we were going to spend the next 20 years raising the kids, doing volunteer work, and traveling. Not much chance of that though. You saw how he was looking at Suzanne, you think he and Suzanne, no. I asked him and he said no. Then I talked to her and she told me that she wouldn't t ever let something like that happen. Her I believe. She sat down and dandled the little boy until he gurgled contentedly. Perry heard Ada going crazy in the kitchen with a mechanical sphincter he'd been building. Rides are a lot of fun. Perry. Your ride, it's amazing. But I don't want to ride a ride for the rest of my life, and Landon is a ride that doesn't stop. You can t get off. Perry was at a loss. Ivey never had a relationship that lasted more than six months. Eva. Ivey got no business giving you advice on this stuff. Kettlewell is pretty amazing. Though. It sounds like you've got him pretty wired. Right. You know that if he s busy, he s happy, and when he s slack, he s miserable. Sounds like if you keep him busy, he ll be the kind of guy you want him to be, even if you want to have much time to play with him. She unholstered a tit and stuck it in the boy's mouth and Perry looked at the carpet. She laughed. You are such a geek. She said. Okay, fine. I hear what you re saying. So how do I get him busy again? Can you use him around here, here? Perry thought about it. I don't think we need much empire building around here, I thought you'd say that. Perry, what the hell am I going to do? There was a tremendous crash from the kitchen, a shriek of surprise. Then a small oops, Ada. Eva called. What now, I was playing ball in the house. Ada said in the same small voice. Even though you have told me not to. And I broke something. I should have listened to you. Eva shook her head. Plays me like a goddamn cello. She said. I am sorry. Perry. We ll pay for whatever it was. He patted her arm. You forget who you re-talking to. I love fixing stuff. Don T sweat it, whatever I ll buy you one and you can use it for parts. Ada. What did you break? Anyway, made of seashells, by the toaster. It is twitching, toast making seashell robot. Perry said. No sweat it was due for an overhaul. Anyway, Christ. She said. Toast making seashell robot. Kettlewell is why we gave up making that kind of thing. He said. Have you seen him, I've a seen him, how penitent was he? He thought back to Kettlewell's long puss on Francis S. Terrace. Yeah, pretty penitent. He s pretty worried. I d say. She nodded. All right then. Maybe he s learned a lesson. Ada, stop breaking things and get your shoes back on, we going back to daddy, yes. She said. Good, Ada said. They were barely out the door when Suzanne and Lester came in. They nodded at Perry and disappeared into the bedroom. Ten minutes later. Suzanne stomped out again. She barely looked at Perry as she disappeared into the corridor, slamming the door behind her. Perry waited five minutes to see if Lester would come out on his own. This happened sometimes with the Fatkins girls, love among the Fatkins was stormy and unpredictable and Lester seemed to like bragging about the meltdowns they experienced, each one an oddity of sybaritic Fatkins culture to boast about. But Lester didn't come out this time. Perry thought about calling him or sending him an email. Finally. Perry went and knocked at his door. Oh, go back to the living room. I-L-L come out. I-L-L come out. Perry went back and moused desultorily at some ride fan blogs for a while, listening for Lester's door opening. Finally, out he came. Long-faced and puffy-eyed. Perry shook his head. Was everyone miserable tonight? Hello. Lester. He said. Something on your mind. He barked a humorless laugh. With her. I am still fat. Perry nodded as though he understood, though he didn't. Since Fatkins. Ive felt like. I don't know, a real person. When I was big. I was invisible and totally asexual. I didn't think about having sex with anyone and no one ever thought about having sex with me. 
When I felt something for a woman, it was more like a big, romantic love, like I was a beast and she was a beauty and we could enjoy some kind of chaste, spiritual love. Fatkins made me, whole. A whole person, with a life below my belt as well as above my neck. I know it looks gross and desperate to you, but to me it's a celebration. Every time I get together with a Fatkins girl and we re, you know, partying for both of us it becomes something really intimate. A denial of pain. A fuck you to the universe that made us so gross and untouchable. And with her, you re still fat. Huh, Lester winced. Yeah, it's my problem. I guess I really resent her for not wanting me when I was big, though I totally get why she wouldn't t have, maybe you re angry that she wants you now, huh? Lester looked at his hands, which he was dry washing in his lap. Okay, maybe. Why should she want me now? I am the same person, after all, except that you re whole now, you are k, Lester started pacing. Who broke the toast robot? Kettlewell's daughter. Ada, Eva was over with the kids. She moved out on Kettlebelly. He thought about whether he should tell Lester. What the hell? She thinks he s in love with Suzanne, Jesus. Lester said. Maybe we should swap. I ll take Eva and he can take Suzanne, you re such a pig. Perry said. You know as Fatkins fuck, food and folly, so what s going on with you and Suzanne now, she s gone away until I can get naked around her without either bursting into tears or making sarcastic remarks. Jesus. Crying. Perry cool dnt remember when he d ever seen Lester cry. It was Waterworks City these days around here. Ah, Perry just wanted this day to be over. He missed Hilda, though he barely knew her. It would have been nice to have someone here at home with him, someone he could cuddle up to in bed and talk this all out with. Maybe he should call Jan. He hit the button on his computer that made the TV blink the time in Morse code. It was 1 a.m. He d have to be up in six hours to get the ride up and running. Screw all this, he was going to bed. He hadnt even gotten a single email from Hilda since he d left Madison. Not that he d sent one to her, of course. Lester was still snoring when Perry slipped out of the condo, a bulb of juice and a microwavable venison and quail egg breakfast burrito under his arm. He had a little glove box microwave and by the time he hit his first red light, the burrito was nuclear hot and ready to eat. He gobbled it one-handed while he made his way to the ride. There were two cop cars at the end of the driveway leading to the parking lot. Broward County Sheriff's Deputy Black and Whites parked horizontally to blockade the drive. Perry pulled over and got out of his car slowly, keeping his hands in plain sight. The doors of the cruisers opened. 2. The deputies already had their mirror shades on, though the sun was still rising, and they set down their coffees on the hood of the cars. This yours, a deputy said, jerking his thumb over his shoulder at the flea market and the ride. Perry knew better than to answer any questions. Can I help you, we re-shutting you down, buddy. Sorry. The cop was young. Latina and female, her partner was older, white and male, with the ruddy complexion that Perry associated with old-time Florida cops. What s the charge, there s no charge. The male cop said. He sounded like he was angry already and anything Perry said would just make him angrier. We charge you if we re going to arrest you. We reinforcing an injunction. Now, if you try to get past us, we ll come up with a charge and then we ll arrest you, can I see the injunction, sure, you can go to the courthouse and see the injunction, Aaron t you supposed to have a copy of it to show to me, am I the cop s grin was mean and impatient. Can I go and get some stuff from my office, if you want to get arrested you can. He pulled a dyspeptic face and drank some coffee, then got back into his cruiser. The other cop had the grace to look faintly embarrassed at her asshole partner, but then she. Too, got back in her car. Perry thought furiously about this. The cop was clearly itching to bust his ass. Maybe he hated the ride, or this duty, or maybe he hated Perry maybe he was one of the cops who had raided the shantytown all those years before. Perry had taken a pretty big settlement off the county over the shot in his head, and it was a sure bet that a lot of cops had suffered for it and now harbored some enmity for him. As bad as this was, it was about to get worse. The goth kids who'd been hanging around in droves lately they didnt seem like the sort with a lot of good instincts when it came to dealing with authority figures. Then there were the flea market stall owners, who'd be coming over the road to open their shops in an hour or so. 
This could get really goddamned ugly. He needed a lawyer, and someone to front for him with the lawyer. He could call Jan he would call him, in fact, but not just yet. There were limits to what Jan could do from Boston, after all. He got back in his car and peeled across the road to the shantytown and the guesthouse. Kettlewell. He thumped the door. Come on. Landon, it s me. Perry. It s an emergency. He heard Eva curse, then heard movement. Was eat, sorry, man. I wouldn't t have woken you but it s a real emergency, fire, no. Cops. They they shut down the ride. Kettlewell opened the door a crack and stared at him with a red-rimmed, hungover eye. Cops shut down the ride, yeah, they say there s an injunction, gimme a sec, gotta put some pants on. He closed the door. As Perry listened to the sounds of him getting dressed, he reflected that he did done Eva the favor she de been seeking, he de found something to keep Kettlewell busy. Kettlewell quizzed him intensely as they drove back across the road to the police cars. He called Jan and got voicemail, left a brief message, then got out of the car and stood still outside it, waving at the cop cars. What? The male cop looked even more dyspeptic. Hi there. I wondered if I could get you to explain what s going on here so we can open up shop again, we vey shut you down to enforce an injunction, what injunction is that? A court injunction. Which court? The cop looked really angry for a second, then he got back in his car and fished around. Broward County. He sounded aggrieved. Is that the injunction there? Kettlewell said. No the cop said, too quickly. They both knew he was lying. Jerking them around. Can I see it? Does it have information about who to talk to to get the injunction lifted? Kettlewell's tone was even. Pleasant and very adult. The voice of someone used to being obeyed. Ull have to go to the courthouse. They open in a couple hours, I'd really like to see it, oh for Christ's sakes. The female cop said. Just show it to them. Tom. God, she spat on the ground. Her partner gave her a look. Then handed the paper over to Kettlewell, who pored over it intently. Perry's shoulder surfed him and gathered that they were being shut down for infringing Disney Parks Company trademarks. That was weird. You could hardly go 10 feet in Florida without tripping over a bootleg Mickey, so why should the market stall's Mickey designs trigger legal action? All right. Then. Kettlewell said. Let us make some phone calls. They got in the car and drove across the road to the shantytown. There was a tea house that opened early and they commandeered its window table and spread out their things. Perry called Lester and woke him up. It took two or three tries to get his head around it Lester cool dnt figure out why they de shut down the market stalls, but once he got that the ride was down too, he woke up fast and promised to meet them. Kettlewell's conversation with Jan was a lot more heated. Perry tried to eavesdrop but cool dnt make any sense of it. All the rides are down. He said once he de-dropped the phone to bounce a couple times on the tabletop, making the coffees shiver. Every one of them was shut down by the cops this morning, you re-shitting me. But they don't t all sell the same stuff, they were shut down because of Disney trademarks in the ride itself, or so it seems. Now, what are we going to do? Jan S. hired a lawyer for the Boston Group and we can hire one for here, but I don't think we re going to be able to hire fixers everywhere that their s a ride. That s going to be really expensive. Disney S. filed all the injunctions at the state level they have an industry association they work through that has cooperating attorneys in every city in the country, so it was easy for them, holy crap. Yeah. Who did you piss off? Perry, damned if he knew. He literally cool dnt think of a single person who de want to do this someone had convinced the Disney company to clobber him like Godzilla going after Tokyo. It just didnt make any sense. So what do we do? Kettlewell looked at him. I have no clue. Perry. You are in a company. You are in a network of companies. You are in an industry association. No one can speak for you. You can t lobby or even field a spokesman. I mean. None of that stuff works for you and that s the only way I know to fight back in court, I thought we were immune to this stuff. If there s no one to sue, how can they sue us, if there s no one to sue? There s no one to show up in court and object. Either, yeah, I don't think we can incorporate you in time to make a difference. Kettlewell said. So we need to think of something else. Suzanne slid into the booth beside them. Her hair was tied back and her makeup was spare and severe. She had on European cut trousers. 
high like a bolero dancer s, and a loose, flowing white cotton over shirt on top of a luminescent pink tank. Perry cool dnt tell whether it was formal or informal, but it looked good and a little intimidatingly foreign. She didnt meet Perry si. Brief me. She said. She held out her phone and put it in record mode. Kettlewell ran it down quickly and she nodded, jotting notes. So what happens next, not much we can do. Kettlewell said. The riders will be along shortly. Oh, and the merchants. Perry still cool dnt catch her eye. I'll go take some pictures. She said. Be careful. Perry said. She mugged for him. Sweetie. I take pictures of the mafia. Then it was all right between them again. Somehow. Right. Kettlewell said. How s our time looking? Got 30 minutes until the first of the merchants show up. An hour until the riders start turning up, you don't have a lawyer, do you? Perry quirked his funny eyebrow. Stupid question. Okay. Right. I'll make some more calls. Let us get some people out of bed, what can I do? Kettlewell looked at him. Huh. Um. This is really my beat now. I suppose you could go keep Suzanne company, gee, thanks, something wrong with Suzanne, nothing s wrong with Suzanne. He said. Okay, off I go. He set off on foot. The shantytown had woken up now, people getting ready for the hike to the early buses into places where the few remaining jobs were. He took his phone out and tossed it from hand to hand. Then he called the number that he deprogrammed in all those days ago in Madison but had never bothered to call. He forgot until the ringing started that it was another time zone there an hour or two earlier. But when Hilda answered, she sounded wide awake. Nice of you to call. She said. Nice of you to answer. Her voice sent a thrill up his spine. We've a got cops outside of the ride here. She said. We've a only been live for a week. Two, they re at every ride. He said. They shut us down too, well, what are you going to do about it, what am I going to do about it? Sure, this is your thing. Perry. We woke up and discovered the cops this morning and the first thing everyone did was wonder when you decall with the plan, you re-kidding. What do I know about cops? What do any of us know about cops? All we know is we built this thing after you came and talked to us about it and now it has been shut down, so we re-waiting for you to tell us what to do next. He groaned and sat down on a curb. Oh, crap. Then she sighed heavily at the other end. Okay, Perry, you need to pull it together. We need you now. We need something that explains what is going on, what to do next, and how to do it. There is a lot of energy out here, a lot of people ready to fight. Just point us in the right direction, I have a guy who is trying to figure that out right now, perfect. Now you need to set up a conference call with every ride operator so we can talk this over. Get online and post a time and an address. I'll chat it up and make some calls. You make some calls too. Everyone likes to hear from you. They like to know you re on their side, right? He said, getting back to his feet. Turning around to get his computer out of his trunk. Right. That s totally the right thing to do. I am on it, good man. She said. A little pause stretched between them. So, he said. How you doing, apart from all this? Her laugh was merry. I thought you'd never ask. I am looking forward to your next visit, is how I am doing, really, of course really. You sounded a little pissed at me there is all. He sounded like a lovesick teenager. I mean he broke off. Your ass needed kicking, was all. Pause. I am not pissed at you. Though. When are you coming for a visit? Got me. He said. I guess I should. Right. He really sounded like a teenager. You need to visit all the sites, check in on how we redoing. Pause. Plus you should come hang out with me some. He almost pointed out all her warnings about only having a one night stand and not missing the people he was away from and so forth, but stayed his tongue. The fact that she wanted him to come for a visit was overshadowing everything, even the looming crisis with the cops. It s a deal, deal, well, bye, bye. He almost said, you hang up first, but that would have been too much. Instead he just kept the phone at his ear until he heard her click. Suzanne was pointing and shooting like mad. Perry sat down on the cracked pavement beside her and unfolded his computer and started sending out emails, setting up a conference channel. He gave Suzanne a short version of his talk with Hilda, being careful not to give a hint of his feelings for her. She sounds like a sensible girl. Suzanne said. You should go and pay her another visit. 
He blushed and she socked him in the shoulder. Take your call, she said. The cops were giving them the hairy eyeball, and Perry screwed in his headset. The conference channel was filling up. Perry checked off names as reps from all the rides came online. There was a lot of tight, tense chatter. Jokes about the fuzz. Okay, Perry said. Let us get it started. There s cops blockading every ride. Right. Use the poll please. He posted a poll to the conference page and it quickly got to 100% green. So I just found the cops outside of mine. Too, and I am not sure what to do about it. I've a got some dough for a lawyer, but I can t afford lawyers for everyone. To make that work, we d have to fly attorneys to every city with a ride in it, and that s not practical as I am sure you can tell. A half dozen flags went up in the conference page. I need someone to play moderator. Cause I can t talk and mod at the same time.